technical problems which seem to chase us around. Uh, but it, welcome folks to Perth Machine Learning Group. Um, so if you if you need the group, then you can use the, um, the QR code there to uh, follow us on Slack. Uh, you can follow us on Meetup, LinkedIn, or on uh, Twitter on Perth ML Group. And um, if you're interested in kind of getting into uh, fast into uh, machine learning, then you can. We really recommend like looking at fast AI, which is run out of University of San Fran under Jeremy Howard. Great course, a uh, couple of parts already out in on the new course. Um, great way of uh, learning machine learning. And of course, the, the book for the course is also out. You can download that for free on GitHub or you can grab it on Amazon. A really good book, really good way of um, picking up the material. It's really faithful to the uh, to the like 18 hours of video or so that they have. Um, live coding, help me out here, Han. What do we, what do we? Okay, so if, if you're really keen and, and on, uh, you're, you've kind of shifted your clock through the US time, you want to get in on live coding, then then feel free to jump onto the uh, live coding, which is on uh, the Fast AI Discord server. Um, yep, just general advice, uh, we have this in here as a disclaimer, just so it allows people to freak speak freely, or freak speedily. Um, so, yep, no need to worry too much about that. Uh, speakers wanted, so we're always on the outlook for, for, for speakers. Um, and it can really be on any topic. So if you're just beginning and you want to go out and learn something and then share it with the group, we're always interested in that. Or conversely, if you want to bring in uh, your, the paper that you're working on, or uh, you want to bring in an external speaker, then then brilliant. You know, the more speakers we can get, the better. I want to say thanks to our sponsors, which are Western Power, AWS, Microsoft, and JetBrains. I think we still have some JetBrains licenses. If anybody's interested in PyCharm or one of the other JetBrains IDEs, and then just a, a plug for next Thursday, which is uh, synthetic minority oversampling using uh, GAN techniques. Um, it should be a really interesting talk. Uh, so yeah, please join us for that one. And I'd like to pass this on to us speaker for tonight, that would be Adrian Goody and Jonathan Stewart. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sean, for the opportunity to present to the group and also for us to tap into the experience and expertise for the group. So as we described in the invitation, uh, this is a collaborative project that's been run between the cardiology department and the emergency departments of Fiona Stanley and also looking to expand it to some other hospitals. And we'd like to also thank Professor Girish Ravindi, who is the Professor of Cardiology who started this and uh, got it up and running. So what I'd like to do is to present some background information about the problem of chest pain and patients with chest pain in the emergency department. And then I'm going to hand over to Jonathan, who's going to give a little bit background of the history of some of the things that have been done so far, and also to talk about the specifics of the project that we're looking at at the moment. So to put it into context, chest pain is a common presenting complaint for the people coming to the emergency department. Uh, it's usually the second most common complaint. And the causes range from both the very common to the very uncommon, to between being life-threatening on one end of the spectrum, through to uncomfortable, but self-resolving and self-limiting, uh, and with no danger, essentially no danger at the other end. And so there's a list of some of the more frequent causes. There is actually also some very unusual things. Uh, the tachyarsis arteritis I threw in there is a very uncommon cause. Um, but in there we can see there are things like esophageal reflux and spasm, which can be very uncomfortable, but not dangerous, through to acute myocardial infarctions and dissections and pulmonary emboli that certainly uh, can kill people very rapidly sometimes. Okay. 
Okay. Do you have it? Coming through. Uh, uh, here. Then to Adrian. Yeah. Okay. So when we look at the uh, information about this with the epidemiology, the scamic heart disease, I think as most people will realise, is the leading cause of death and has been for generations. Uh, certainly the data from the 1950 onwards, it's listed as number one, and even before then, it's probably still the most common, although the way they describe it was slightly different. However, when we look at that from the individual perspective, only about one in 10 people who turn up with chest pain will actually have what we refer to as an acute coronary syndrome, uh, what colloquially people term a heart attack. And it's certainly not the most common cause of chest pain for most people who turn up to the department, but it's the one that we do worry about a lot. So when someone turns up with chest pain, how do we actually work out what's going on? So the first thing we'll do is we see them and we ask them lots of questions. We ask them about their background, their other medical problems, and also about the details of the episode itself. We take a history. We then look for physical changes associated with various diseases. We examine them. And then considering those things in the context particularly of the person's risk factors, we'll decide to perform some tests. Now, some of those tests, like the electrocardiogram, we'll do almost every time. Others will do slightly less frequently, and some will do only occasionally. We take the information, particularly if we get the test results back. We reconsider those results in the setting of all the previous information. And then we decide we might need to do some more tests. And eventually, we come to a decision. And we hope it's the right one. The way we do this, there's sort of two mental models that people talk about to do this. One is a Bayesian approach, where particularly if we're talking about tests, we decide what is the risk beforehand, the pre-test probability. We take the result from the test, we apply that, and then we get a post-test probability. And then if we get further tests, we do iterate across that again until we finally get to a level of confidence, at which point we can say that's going to be our decision. The reality for most of this time, though, is that we actually take all that information and sort of process it at once to come up with a gestalt impression, the overall impression of what we think is going on, and we'll make a decision based on that. Now, one of the things that we need to recognise when we do all this is that, particularly the history, there's a lot of variation and vagueness in the information we can get from that. What we know is that the data we get from various questions varies depending on how we ask the question, whether we ask leading questions, whether we ask open-ended questions and so on. There's often different interpretations of the words that we use. For example, we'll often ask, is the pain sharp or is it dull? And people sort of reply and say, oh yeah, yeah, it was really bad, really sharp. And we say, well, okay, well, we understand the severity was bad, but what about the character? Was it sharp or dull? And they'll say, yeah, it was really sharp, really bad. And we don't really know, are they talking about the severity or the character? Similarly, the term chronic, in medical parlance, that really is a description of the time course of the disease. It has no bearing on severity. And yet many people will use the word chronic when they mean severe. And of course, when you get second languages involved, it becomes even more complicated. We also know that if we repeatedly ask the same question, and anyone who's been to hospital knows you get asked the same questions again and again and again and again, the answers often vary. And they vary not just between doctors, but you know, if I see someone and then an hour and a half later I come back and I've got some test results and I say, just run me through again what, what that episode was like, and then I look at what I've written down from initially, the two are often very different. Now, whether that the information provided is different or my interpretation of it is different, uh, there's components of both, probably. But the result of this is that we know that the features of history are often very poorly predictive as to what the underlying cause is. And yet, despite that, we do place a lot of weight on the history. So what are the things that we do 
often is we'll take this information and we try and integrate it into a clinical prediction scores. And there's a range of these. The one that's sort of in vogue at the moment most of all is called the heart score. And interestingly, this is a score that was created not by very complex statistical methods. It was actually a very small research project by one junior doctor who, I'm assuming in consultation with her uh, more experienced peers, chose a list of what they thought would be good expected, expected predictors of the disease. And despite that, this is actually one of the best performing scores. One of the things I would like to point out is that if you look where under the history component, the scoring of that is based on whether the doctor who saw the person thought it was highly suspicious, moderately suspicious, or slightly suspicious. But there are absolutely no definitions as to what those actually are and what they mean. So once again, it comes back to that gestalt feeling, which of course is influenced by all the other factors. But as I said, despite that, the measure of the area under the curve rates fairly well. Some of the other prediction scores I've listed there, these were actually derived from larger population groups with multivariate logistic regression. Despite that, they perform a little less well. And part of that is because they were actually derived from people who they'd already decided had ischemic heart disease and then they were used as predictors of short-term complications. And yet now we're using them to try and predict the diagnostic likelihood of having the underlying disease. The other thing that I think we need to bear in mind when we're talking all about these is we understand that no test is perfect. And therefore, there is always gonna be a trade-off between what we have as a miss rate and how many how good the prediction is of the patient having the disease based on those particular tools or tests. There's in technical parlance, the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. Now, because all tests have side effects and all treatments have side effects, if we actually aim for a 0% miss rate, we don't actually get the best outcome. I mean, for me, it's easy to have a 0% miss rate. Everybody walks through the door, I say, oh, I'm going to do the full testing and give you the full treatment for it. I won't miss anybody, but I know I'll actually be doing more harm than good. Now, in terms of tests, sometimes those are fairly minor. For example, the electrocardiogram, some people will get an allergic type reaction and they get an itchy skin or some blistering from the dots. That's uncommon. It's a fairly minor thing. But once you start talking about the more invasive tests, like for example, the stress testing, you get somebody on a treadmill and tell them to go really, really hard, every now and then, one of them will drop dead on you. Not very common, fortunately, but it does happen is a risk factor. And if we start doing things like coronary angiography, people start putting wires and tubes around into your heart vessels, then occasionally that can cause complications and it can actually induce heart attacks. And to put all this into context as an example, the University of Adelaide and their hospitals released a study last year they had introduced a new, more sensitive blood test to look at these problems. It's now the standard test across Australia. And they measured the rate of heart attacks. And not surprisingly, these tests picked up more heart attacks. They had fewer misses. But the consequent extra testing and treatment actually caused an equivalent number of heart attacks. So overall, the number of heart attacks was no different. So the natural heart attacks were lower but the induced iatrogenic heart attacks were actually higher. So this leads to the concept of test thresholds and treatment thresholds, where we try and find that balance point where we make sure that we're not causing more harm than the disease would on its own. In terms of chest pain, the approaches that we're currently going as well, just as a background figure, we, we believe, to the, and the best information we have is that we miss somewhere between 1% or just underneath of people with heart attacks in that group who present with chest pain. Of course, the other thing we also have to bear in mind is all the other normal issues that we have with machine learning, explainability, and we can argue whether that does or doesn't, uh, or how important that should be. Is it just the outcome that counts? Certainly in terms of people's acceptance, I think it's a very big issue. In terms of the misses that will occur, and we accept that nothing is perfect. There is also the concept that 
if it's a myth that no other system, in particular no human, would have been able to expect, well, that's kind of an acceptable myth. On the other hand, if it's a myth where you look at the information and go, really? That was actually pretty obvious. Then people feel that's an unacceptable myth. Many machine learning models are created to give a yes or no answer. But as I sort of suggested, in many cases, we don't expect a yes or no answer. We are quite comfortable and used to a almost certainly yes, almost certainly no, but well, maybe some shades of grey in between. So maybe the model needs to be designed to have yes, no, and only sure. Or at least when it's predicting a yes or a no, a method of reporting the confidence we have in that result. There's also, of course, the issues with data set bias and making sure that the results are generalizable once it's been developed. And as I said, all the other usual issues in terms of generating machine learning models. So that's the sort of background information to the problem as we are approaching it. And I'm going to hand over now to Jonathan uh, for a summary of the previous research and the basis of where we're at at the moment. Thank you. Yep, so I'm Jonathan, one of the um, trainees in emergency medicine. I'm oh, sorry, I've got notes on my phone. <laughs> so I'm just going to go over a bit of the previous research um, that's been done before and also uh, a little bit of what we're wanting to do with our project. Uh, so the first one, this is a paper, um, Use of Artificial Neural Network for Data Analysis in Clinical Decision Making, uh, Diagnosis of Acute Coronary Occlusion. Um, really only putting up there because it was published in 1990, so people have been trying to do this for a long time, um, so sort of 30 years ago. Uh, and then a little bit more background, um, this is a molecule uh, troponin, so this shows a, a muscular filament, so you can imagine little heads are kind of what pull the muscle along and help things contract. So the little uh, coloured circles there are um, molecules of troponin, um, and they're basically proteins that are found in cardiac muscle. Um, when the muscle's damaged, it leaks out into the blood, and that's what we're looking for in the, in the blood test when we're looking to see if someone's had a heart attack. Um, the, the trouble is that it's not just a heart attack that can cause a high troponin level. It could be um, maybe they've got heart failure that's long standing, nothing's really changed, or maybe they've got bad kidneys that can't filter out all the troponin. So just because they've got a high troponin doesn't mean that they've necessarily had a heart attack, but it's definitely something we look for. And um, you can get quite good results with minimal inputs into machine learning algorithms. So this is a paper from 2019, machine learning to predict likelihood of acute myocardial infarction, so uh, to predict heart attack. Um, they used a gradient boosting machine learning algorithm um, and they only incorporated age, gender, the troponin level on arrival, and then a, sec a second troponin level at some, some time after the first. Um, and then their model was able to sort of to put out an output between zero and 100 as a, a risk score, so um, to reflect the individual's likelihood of uh, having a diagnosis of a heart attack. So it was sort of a yes and no. Um, this was, it was trained on 3,000 patients and tested on 8,000, and that's actually one of the largest data sets we've seen um, in this machine learning research for chest pain. Um, and it was a, a multi-center international trial, so quite big. And they got pretty good results. So this is the calibration curve on the left-hand side, so the um, dotted line would be if it's perfect, um, and then the uh, receive operating characteristic curve on the right. So they found that um, the area under the curve was uh, 0.96. Um, if their model classified you as low risk, which was about 70% of the patients they studied, it had a specificity of um, about 98%. And if it classified you as high risk, which was about 10% of the patients in the study, um, sorry, sensitivity of 98% and a specificity of 97 for the, the high risk. Um, basically, it was, it was pretty good. Um, another concept to talk about is something called the MACE. Um, so mortality, so someone dying uh, within a week or a month after being to the ED is fortunately quite rare. Um, so a lot of cardiovascular research, they use a composite out, uh, outcome that, um, 
that looks at a range of different outcomes. So not just all cause mortality, but they also look at people who had a cardiac arrest, if they got readmitted to hospital and needed a, uh, if they had a heart attack or needed a bypass, uh, if they had to have a stent put in, or if they had another had serious had cardiac, cardiac intervention. This is another recent paper. So this was published in 2020, this year. Um, there's a new risk stratification score for patients with suspected cardiac chest pain in the ED based on machine learning. And so they developed a, a risk stratification model looking at seven day MACE, so that composite outcome of lots of different uh, possibilities for patients presenting to the ED with chest pain. Um, they used various machine learning algorithms, so they used uh, extreme gradient boosting, support vector machines, and logistic regression. Uh, and they looked at adult patients presenting to an ED with chest pain. Their data set was around 800 patients, and that seems to be more typical of the uh, machine learning research that's been done before. And they used the 70 30 training test split. Uh, their, their inputs were demographic data, um, the characteristics of the chest pain, so whether uh, where the location was, the feature, and variations, and like Adrian was saying, whether it was sharp or dull or achy, which has its issues. Um, also, the vital signs of the patient, so their heart rate, their blood pressure, um, their respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, things like that. Um, the patient's medical history, their family history of heart disease, and also uh, ECG, so the heart tracing. Um, and this is the, these are the results, the receive operating characteristics. Um, so the interesting, one of the interesting things about it is actually compared it to the heart score, which like Adrian was saying, is sort of the gold standard at the moment for trying to risk stratify this chest pain. And you see the XG boost uh, performed best out of everything and it beat the, uh, would perform better than the heart score. Um, so the AUC of the XG boost was about, uh, around 0.82 and the heart score was 0.7. So just to talk a bit about uh, our project that we're working on. Um, so working in collaboration with UWA Computer Science, who are providing sort of machine learning expertise, um, we're looking at machine learning to risk stratify undifferentiated chest pain in the emergency department. Uh, and our plan is to develop the models retrospectively on a, a data set, then potentially next year to test them prospectively. Um, and later on as well to add different data sets to see that improves now. So for example, one thing is uh, cardiac ultrasound to actually see how the heart's pumping. So if you add that data in it, that can improve the models. Um, and hopefully, looking at undifferentiated chest pain, we'll be able to go from that to other undifferentiated presentations, so abdominal pain or headache or dizziness, um, and then predicting outcomes. So the data, uh, we're still in the process of obtaining it, so going through ethics mm -hmm. approvals and things like that. We think there's going to be about 15,000 presentations over the last five years to the Pure Stanley ED for chest pain, uh, which will be one of the biggest data sets that have been used in this sort of research. And it's really a mix of data, so we'll have demographics, um, sort of age, gender, um, we'll have the triage notes, so what happens when you sort of show up to the ED and the person at the front desk takes your details. Um, the clinical notes written by the, the treating doctors, which will be free text, um, but also include the, the past medical history, some medications and things like that, and examination findings. Um, the patient's vital signs in the AD, um, laboratory data, so troponin and other blood tests, uh, potentially also chest x-ray, which could be images, and also a radiology report, so when you get a chest x-ray, um, they're all reported by specialist radiologists, so that's text data. Um, ECG potentially, which would be, I think, image data, how it's stored on the, um, the sort of uh, the systems that they use in the ED, if you understand me. And then outcomes, so whether the patient, um, whether they, they died in the next 7 to 30 days, whether they had another heart attack, um, whether they needed a stent put in, or, or uh, whether nothing bad happened. So, sort of a, a few different things we're trying to tie together, uh, and that's really. I guess where we're at at the moment um, and what we're looking for input or any advice or suggestions on um, is actually developing the model. Um, so we're, we're trying to integrate um, quite a lot of different data sets 
different kinds of data. So some will be free text, some will be numerical, some will be categorical, some potentially images. Um, we're trying to build something that's modular so that if at a later date we have a new data set that we want to try and add into the model, we can do that fairly uh, painlessly. Um, and, and I guess uh, as well, if uh, it'd be great to get to the point where we have sort of a trained model that at a later date we can then apply to a different presentation, so abdominal pain, so maybe it's just um, a slight bit of retraining that's still got the sort of uh, fundamental risk stratification. Because there, are, there is a lot of overlap in things that, um, you know, if you've got, if you're elderly, if you've got poor health, you're on a lot of medications, you're going to be at high risk for a whole range of different things. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really where we're at. And I want to show if you want to add anything, Adrian. Uh, no, I think at this point, uh, I'd just like to say, first of all, has anybody got any questions on the information that we presented? Uh, and then following from there, if people have got suggestions as to things like, of those potential sources of data, what's going to be the best way to approach them? Um, things like the notes are an electronic medical record, but it is free text within that electronic medical record. Um, so there's some uh, structure to it, but most of, of the text, for example, is, is free text. Do you mind put so, that slide on so people can um, remember? The data one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Could we take the audio from... I can't take the audio from... Oh, but if we mute this one, then we can maybe take your audio so we can... It sounds like someone's talking, but we can't hear Yeah, them. maybe just yeah. tell them to type it in the chat because no one can I hear them talking. Or just to just uh, say in the mic that if they have a question, just type it in the chat. Yeah, so... Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, We've it's a little difficult to uh, hear people speaking through Discord. So if people could type their questions in and then we will read them out and answer them as best we can. That's probably going to be the best way of doing it. I think the last time is a main tool. So, this is a general question. Mm. You know how the government, uh, last year, they allowed sharing of data? Is that, I don't know too much about it. Was that not a thing the government's trying to do? Uh, you signed off and you could share uh, the health there, there is the My Health yes. Record, so that's yeah. a national record. Uh, Agent, do you mind to repeat the question first before you... Yeah, sorry. So the question is about the electronic My Health record, which is run by the government and access to that sort of information. Um, I don't know what the processes for accessing that information are from a research possibility. Uh, I haven't heard anything about it. Um, I think in the longer term it, it will probably be uh, a valuable resource, but at this stage I don't know of any mechanisms. I think at the moment they're too concerned about keeping it private so rather than yeah. letting it out, as well as all the differences of how it goes in. That system is generally more orientated towards um, general practice mm -hmm. and rather than the in-hospital section, although the hospital can retrieve data from it and also feed uh, particularly discharge summaries into it. Um, okay. Have you considered like link data for WA Department of Health? Yeah, so, yep. yeah. Um, so the question is about the link data that's available through uh, the public, WA Public Health. Yeah. So that would be great, that would be ideally what we're looking for for outcome. Um, I know Prof Devaney who's sort of heading the project has some experience using link data before and he sort of suggested that it takes quite a while, it's really bit expensive, sort of looking at a year or two before we get access to it. So the idea we've got is to try to do things locally initially and then maybe that would be a bit of a, uh, validation for what we're doing and then we try and expand the scope. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, the, that, the link data probably would be the gold standard, um, but they have very tight regulations with it and I think one, one of which is they don't release the data for either two or three years. Um, 
after the actual data is collected okay. uh, to try and ensure privacy and so on. Um, but yes, in the long term, we would hope to use that because it is it does have the greatest coverage. Um, having said which, the data we can access through uh, that we can access um, through the public health system will cover most of the patient episodes. Yeah. yeah, I guess there, there is always a chance that mm -hmm. someone has had a heart attack and they've gone to a private hospital instead of, and it's just sort of been um, lost in the medical records. Um, but hopefully that will be a small. Um, yeah. question in uh, yeah. the chat. Can you see it from your computer? Or? Uh, from if I bring up the chat on here, we're going to lose that on the risk card. Yes, uh, Jimmy White is asking, so the process is gather initial data from patient, then assess, gather more data, assess, and repeat if necessary? Yes, yeah, so... Do we, should we repeat the question? No, 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 just, no, 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 just, just um, in the chat. Mm, <laughs> so the data will be retrospectively there, so it is already sort of... It's from presentations that have already happened in the last five years or so, so we're not going to be actually uh, uh, like talking to patients and writing things down and typing or whatever. Um, it's just accessing the database that already exists. The idea is that we use that to try and build the best model that we can, um, but then to sort of further uh, validate things, we're going to we'll, we'll test it prospectively. Um, so on new data that comes in over the next year or so. The, retro the retrospective data will always have an interpretation component with it because the person who heard the information or took the information writes down and there is always an element of interpretation in there. So again, in the end, a prospective uh, tool is going to be the best, but the idea is to start with the retrospective data because we've got a much larger pool of it uh, that we can access and then try and build up some models and at least have an idea of what approach we should have to the models for that final part. Um. So I guess a, a question that I was wondering, if everyone might be able to have some input on, sort of been reading a lot about um, the OpenAI um, GPT-3 model. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're going to have a lot of free text data, which not too many people have looked at free text before. It's always been pretty hard to wrangle and quite messy. It, I wonder if there's any way to use their, their API to uh, contribute to these models. Like, can you sort of combine it with the other data sources that we're having? Um, I think we last time we. Is not Even at the same hospital between different doctors, like one of the difference of Adrian's. Yeah, so I think that is um, yeah. quite common in the medical space. It's not really yeah. uniform in, in terms of terminology. Um, so that is causing the problem. So if you train in the open AI, if you come into here, mm. um, I didn't play with the test, but I play with the um, pre-trained surgery cars. They actually don't have the walk people. They never see the um, certain um, history, certain more, um, more condition. They actually don't have that car. So yeah. with the car, actually, self-driving car come to our curve, they don't know and can't recognize. So that need to be mindful. Mm -hmm. If you just want to do some cut and paste stuff, you need to really know yeah. what is the input training data before you can do the education. Does the free text have spelling mistakes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yes, and, and probably much more commonly than spelling mistakes is abbreviations. Oh, 
Oh. And that's actually one of the biggest problems in all medical notes. Um, the use of abbreviations, non-standard abbreviations, and which makes free text interpretation very, very, very difficult. Okay, the next question is, has there been any separate ECG image classification done? Uh, not by us, but definitely in the past by a lot of other groups. It's a pretty popular area of, of study, like even the Apple Watches where they have the um, automated ECG mm -hmm. interpretation. Um, it's definitely at the point where for a lot of things it's sort of on par with specialists, like specialist interpretation. I mean, most of the ECG machines now all have an automatic interpretation function with them. Uh, I don't think it's a machine learning based function, but they have them. And they are, for most situations, very good. Um, when there's something very unusual, though, then they come up with some really weird suggestions. And um, my personal experience with the kind of Fitbit mm -hmm. um, sensor, mm -hmm. They actually quite biased all the data actually change on the white screen, and I have a more um, color, and then actually the reading is wrong. Yeah, yeah I use the same machine to test on my colleague who is a white person, and I even sitting down maybe over 111 a bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, and actually, it is already identified problem is biased data, mm -hmm. and also the um, the 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 thing actually is affected reading from that um, yeah. webinar reading, so be careful of those types. Yeah, um, I mean some of the very interesting work that's been done on ECG shows that people have used it to make predictions of things that we have never considered are capable of being done. The most famous one is that they're actually very accurate in predicting the gender of the person that they're taken from. Whereas, if you ask a cardiologist to tell a gender based on an ECG, they go, well, unless it's on the sticker in the corner, there's no way you can tell. And yet the machine learning models actually can do that. And so they're also being looked at to try and predict things, uh, things like longer term complications. Uh, this is in the non-emergency setting. Uh, where they're using it to risk stratify people for what might happen in 12, 24, 36 months. And there is some information that's coming out of that. But says there is, even in tests that ECGs have been around for, must be come up to 200 years, and yet there's actually probably information in there that we have not been able to access, uh, which may be being uncovered. And so that's one of the things with a project like this, is how do we take all these different types of data and integrate them together so that we do do the ECG data, do we do the interpretation, or do we look at the raw data? Uh, from that, it's stored as a visual series of squiggles. Um, but in actual fact, I mean, all those squiggles represent electrical vectors of the heart muscle. Um, so maybe we need to try and get the original data from that and then input that. And how do we take all those different segments and put them into one final model? Um, so the question is, please explain the availability of each data type per patient. I assume not all will have an ECG or X-ray. Um, yeah, so there, there definitely will be missing data. Um, in the, the population, I don't think we'll exclude those with missing data either, just to sort of um, try to build a more robust model. I, I guess you could do it both ways. You could train it on a subset that has complete data versus, and then try and extrapolate it to those that have incomplete data. Um, I, most patients who come in with chest pain, I'd say easily over 95%, for, especially will be um, the inclusion criteria would be a, a triage category two chest pain. Um, it's sort of a, a standard that they get an ECG within 10 minutes of arrival. So there, there should be quite a high proportion that have ECGs. Uh, chest X-rays, 
probably a little bit variable as well, and um, the blood test would be variable too. But, um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so there's a comment uh, uh, saying about uh, needing more than one model um, for the various different data to extract useful features and then feed those into a final model. Um, which I think is the sort of thing that we would assume that we will need. Um, but also one of the things is for people to suggest, well, you know, what sort of, if you were looking at dealing with this, what would your approach be? What sort of model would you look at? Would you look at a neural network type model? Would you look at a neural network for the ECG and another for the other data and then try and fit that into you know, a random forest or some other sort of tree structure or what would people suggest? What What's the sort of state of the art approach to these sorts of issues? I guess the, um, there's a couple of things that you're looking at here. There's, there's a couple of things that you're looking at here because um, number one, there's a lot of this is causal. Problem. Now you really have to look at um, to get every closer. Okay, so so you, you have you have a uh, a lot of this data is going to be difficult to disambiguate. Sean. <laughs> okay, let's start that again. So I, I feel like a lot of this data uh, you need to look at um, approach it from causal modelling perspective because it's not going to be um, particularly you, you're, you're, the kind of question that you're asking is a causal question and so you know, if, if you don't model it in that way you you can't kind of get it, that an outcome from just looking at statistics so so that's kind of number one but then number two when you're looking at this maybe you need to be thinking about it as well as looking at the causal model but also as a time series model because you know these are separate um, uh, pieces of data which you have coming in and it's and it's not just it's when they come in and what their relationship is to the next piece of data coming in which will be indicative, you know, that's a very strong thread which ties everything together. Right? So, so it's like the time of the laboratory test, it's the time that the clinical notes were made, it's the time that the chest x-ray was taken, because that expresses the degree of, it's a way of kind of capturing in a way the degree of concern that, that, is, that is there, and the way that the patient is presenting in a way which might not necessarily come over in. I think with the time aspect, definitely with the troponin, that's one of the papers we're talking about when they're looking at the difference between the first and the second, um, which is a really key thing, whether it is going up or going down or staying the same. Mm -hmm. it, um, it's, it's not about the time, it's whether you do it at all. So if someone's got a chest x-ray, it's indicating that you're concerned, you're much more concerned than if they didn't have a chest x-ray. Mm -hmm. So if you train the model um, and you've got check stack trays for some but not for others, that's a, a post hoc indicator of what you are assuming. Mm -hmm. So you need multiple models, as the person in the comment was saying, kind of trained with like the decision-making process as you're going through so that you can fairly treat the whole cohort and then knock some out saying, I don't think that we'd progress these any further. And then we'd choose a chest x-ray and then you train with that information. And as you progress through the steps that you're making, you allow each model's iteration to access more that it would have under those circumstances. Is there any time series that happens once someone is admitted to hospital? Like do you do the same tests over and over? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the, and also partly replying to one of the comments uh, in the thread, the most informative test that we have very early on is the ECG, because that gets done very early and we get an immediate result. And that will also pick out a group of heart attack patients who need urgent and immediate intervention. The most sensitive tests that we have are the blood tests looking for the troponin, 
uh, and they are usually done in a series. So first of all, we look at the initial result and we interpret that in the context also of how long it was done after the onset of the event. Um, and so we look at that result, but we will then also quite commonly, particularly if the first one is negative or borderline, do a second test and then see whether or not that is increasing or decreasing. And what a lot of the work has been done over the last few years is to try and take the time period between those two tests, which initially used to be 12 hours apart, and then it became eight hours apart, and then six hours apart, and now three hours apart, and now in some places they're saying, well, if you're in a low risk group and certain group, we might even be able to do those one hour apart. Because all of this means in terms of how long you have to stay there waiting for your next test. It's, it's very important uh, to try and get that down to the minimum possible without losing the accuracy of the test. So in terms of the time course, that is probably the most important um, thing that we look at is the serial troponin results. Mm. So, so it comes back then to like how you integrate the data. Mm. So if, you, if you're thinking about the um, if you're thinking about so the troponin is like obviously you're going to treat as a time series coming in, but clinical notes. So what was the person reporting? at that time and when were they reporting that with respect to the first um, yeah. um, test, the first lab test, what a secondary like reports, like how are they feeling after the first hour plus the first hour and a half. And so like treating that whole thing as a time series is where it becomes more indicative of what might be happening. Um, but as Peter raised the point, uh, if, and if you don't have an x-ray in there, like how's the algorithm going to, to think of that? Is it going to kind of put a bias, a strong bias towards like whether there's an x-ray or not, which is, you know, it comes back to the causal problem again that you're trying to deal with, but, mm -hmm. but there's, there's lots of kind of confounding factors in here which are, yep. which are going to trip you up. Mm. Yeah, because it, if we make the data set very diverse, then, and particularly because it's being done retrospectively, as you say, some of those data points are going to be absent <clears throat> and the presence or absence of it is going to be a reflection of what people thought at the time of what the underlying cause was. So, as I said, some of these things get done very freely, like the ECG. Uh, the chest X-ray, if we think something is purely ischemic heart disease, then in actual fact, we often don't do an X a chest X-ray. If we're less sure or we think that the pain may be related to some, particularly some sort of lung pathology, then that's the group that actually will more frequently get a chest X-ray. Um, someone's just also brought up about how many ECGs are available per patient. Uh, and there is usually typically a series of ECGs. As we do the sequential blood tests, it is the usual standard is that people will get an ECG done at the same time. And in addition to that, if they have further symptoms or other things change, they may well get additional ECGs. And certainly that is one of the high risk factors that we currently look for is, is the ECG changing over time? Because if it is, then that suggests a, a much higher risk, um, both diagnostically and even within the diagnostic group that is a risk factor for further complications. Um, so the other question that's just been mentioned is for the 15,000 presentations, what proportion of the eight points are available? Uh, I mean, I think I'd say that certainly the demographics, the triage, the clinical notes and the vital signs are available in everybody. The ECG would be available in, within the group we're looking at probably 90%. Chest X-rays probably 40%. Uh, laboratory data uh, of some form will be in the vast majority, probably 80%. The troponins would probably be maybe two thirds, I would say. Yeah. Um, because again, that will be 
that's a test that is done in people where we, if we think there is ischemic heart disease or if we think there, well maybe there could be and we really can't find any other cause. And the patient where we look at them and say, no, I think you've got pneumonia, then we won't do those blood tests. So the absence of those is also, um, probably we hope, is quite a strong predictor for somebody saying they don't have the disease. But as you say, that, that becomes a confounding factor when we're looking at the retrospective data. And similarly, even the prospective data, we're not going to collect all this data on people who we don't think it's needed or do all these tests on people that we don't think it's needed. Um, so there is always going to be some underlying screening with the, with the data set. The ECG is just that snapshot, that's not video. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a snap, it, it does a three second. Yeah. Um, the standard one is, uh, yeah, I think it's about three seconds off the top of my head, it might be five seconds, um, because there's 12 leads and they give you, you know, a couple of seconds with each one and you've done it three at a time. Um, so that's done and then it might be repeated after an hour or, and then after three hours as well um, to see if there's any changes. Yeah. And then within, within each ECG, you know, that's the little funny squiggle that they often put up on medical things, um, you're looking at changes within that time because that's the, the moving electrical vector uh, of the, as the, the heart contracts and then relaxes and it's that pattern through that time course um, that we look at to try and see if there's certain patterns of disease and damage. Yeah, so the, the thing with um, risk stratification is kind of about the grey middle zone so um, say someone's coming to the ED with chest pain, you eventually have to make a choice, like do they go home and see their GP, do they go home and see maybe a cardiologist as an outpatient or do they come into hospital um, or do you treat them as a heart attack? And it's sort of like, say someone young, fit and healthy, they were doing weights yesterday and they're like, well, when I move like this, it, that, that causes them chest pain, they're, they're easy to send home. Uh, and alternatively, the people who are like, I've had 10 heart attacks before and it feels exactly like this and they've got all these changes and all these risk factors, they're, they're in a way easy as well because they're going to get admitted to hospital. There's sort of this group in the middle where you, uh, like maybe it is, maybe it's not, and trying to figure out what the safest thing to do for them is. Um, Adrian, you did mention um, each category of data you got, but how about how they relate to the outcome? So do you know the, um, the data set and what is the outcome, associated outcome? So the outcomes we have available are the initial or the final discharge diagnosis of that episode. Now sometimes that's going to be definitive, uh, particularly if it shows that yes, there is the disease, they have had a heart attack, then we know. Um, we also would have the follow-up for people who either represent or are followed up within the clinics, uh, and that is a significant proportion. Um, the public health system, a lot of their data is done across the whole system. Uh, so for example, things like mortality is, is generally recorded. So you don't have, that will be recorded across the system um, that is linked. And also if somebody presents, you know, the following week at another public hospital, that will get flagged that they have been there and we can get the final discharge diagnosis from the other public hospitals as well. What we won't have um, is the discharge data and also the interventions if they are done through the private system. Uh, mm. We do have maybe some access to some of that but not reliably and that's where the link data set eventually will become mm. the gold standard. Um, but we estimate for most people we will know, have a fairly good uh, measure of the outcome uh, for them, uh, in particular knowing whether or not they've had a major event, either the seven day and the 30 day uh, mark. Uh, because most of that will tend to be done through either through the same hospital 
or if it's going to be done elsewhere, say through the private system, there's, you, there's often a flag that says, you know, this patient was, re was transferred to a private hospital for further investigation or for a specific procedure. So we can capture some of that, but not necessarily reliably. Mm. What outcome you want to achieve? The main outcome I think we want to achieve is going to be, as Jonathan has said, you know, there are some groups that we know are very straightforward <clears throat> um, that we can pick, they come in and it's obviously a heart attack. That group's not a problem. The very low risk group generally also are not a problem. Uh, in that you know the current approach we have to it um, says that particularly in the very low risk group we don't miss many events in that group uh, probably less than one in a thousand but in order to achieve the figures of the the one percent miss rate we've got at the moment there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time in hospital and get a lot of testing done um, and so part of this is to try and improve the specificity of the approach that we have. If we can improve the sensitivity as well, so we lower our miss rate, then that also is a wonderful thing and it would be really nice if we can drop that down. You know, 1%, well, it's not bad, but it's still more than we'd like. So if we can drop that down to half a percent or less, that would be fantastic. I think realistically, trying to get it down below, you know, there are some, some reports where they, they've surveyed people and said, well, what is an acceptable rate? Uh, usually they survey doctors, which I'm not sure how realistic that is, but certainly in the US, some, there's a, there is <clears throat> some surveys where people will say, if it's less than one in a thousand, that's all right. More than one in a thousand, that's unacceptable. And aiming for that, is a very low rate and what it means is that there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time in hospitals and get a lot of tests so if we can even if we can't improve the sensitivity if we can improve the specificity that would actually be a huge benefit as well um, and even again if we can't improve the total figures if we can reach that same figure but at a shorter time period again that's actually got huge benefits and implications. You know, the difference between saying, well, we can get you down to a 1% miss rate, but that means you stay in hospital overnight and get a whole heap of further tests, to, no, we can do this and we can do something and with the results that we're going to get back in an hour, we can get you back to that same level. That becomes uh, a much lower imposition to the patient and also to the system in general. So in your training data, are you going to exclude the easy ones, the ones, the young guys who've been at the gym and are easy to send home and the really obvious ones and just focus on that mid-level area where the, the, the concern is? The plan is, is to um, exclude people with a discharge diagnosis of STEMI, which is um, sort of like a certain type of heart attack. We get really obvious changes on the ECG, the tracing. So. Uh, it looks really different and there's a different kind of pathway they go down. So um, if, if, say, someone calls an ambulance and say have chest pain, the ambos might take an ECG at the seat and notice they've got these really obvious changes. Um, so they call ahead, the cardiologists are ready to go and put a stent in straight away. So it's a, um, you know, quite a different process. I think we'll exclude those ones. I think it's harder to exclude uh, the really low risk ones. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how you reliably do that because sometimes the discharge diagnosis, you might read it and say muscular chest pain, which sounds like a low risk one, but it's only there because they've had the full workup and they've had these negative results. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how you sort of reliably exclude the low, low risk patients. How much time does the doctor have to evaluate the output of the model? Like, are they just after a very simple, you know, probability of each outcome, or are they after a deeper level of analysis with similar uh, patients presenting with similar symptoms from the training set? Uh, 
Um, so when it's if we were to like implement it in practice, yeah. You know, um, I think it would be pretty great that ideally be some um, interpre interpretability about why it came to those conclusions, but it'd be sort of a you know like kind of a thirty second. This patient's high risk for these reasons, so this is they should be admitted to hospital or they should go home and they should have further follow up or whatever. I don't think it'd be like a really in depth kind of um, like here are 10 patients that were similar and here's what happened to them. So, is the decision for the doctor or for the triage nurse? Uh, it would be for the doctor if we're looking at this sort of information because the triage nurse. By virtue of what they do, yeah. they've got a very limited amount of information, a very limited time. They generally won't have any of the investigations uh, that are being done. Uh, ECGs, the ambulance service will now routinely do those on patients, so when they present to TRAG, they may have that. Uh, but other than that, they won't. You know, unless it's somebody who's been to their GP, got a test, and then the GP rings up and says, the test result shows this, go to the hospital, yeah. which is usually a pretty straightforward situation. Um, so it would be looking at once they have been in and once they've been evaluated. Uh, and you know, a lot of this is looking at replacing what our current approach is, which is using these fairly simplistic models, um, where we do these things and there yeah, we go, Ooh, we score you two because you've got a highly suspicious history and your ECG or that scores one because it's got non-specific changes and your blood tests have come back negative so that gives you a score of three so that says you're going to go home but get referred to a clinic within the next seven days for further functional testing or mm -hmm. oh, your score is nine so you get admitted to hospital or your score is zero so you go home and we recommend no further testing. Um, I mean, that's the model we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so any new model would fit into that paradigm most easily. But of course, if the new model suddenly says, well, in fact, I can do a lot better than that, well, then maybe we have to change our paradigm. Um, and a lot of it is relating to that next step as to what tests do we do? Because, as I said, with all of them, there's a trade-off between specificity and sensitivity. But also, as you tend to get towards the much more specific tests, those are the ones that tend to be both more, both more costly financially, but also more costly in terms of side effects. Um, you know, so a lot of the time, if you, if we deem you're very high risk, we'll skip all the other tests and you might go straight to coronary angiography because we think, yes, the likelihood of you having disease is higher. And then when we, if you get to that level, it's not only do you have the disease or not, it's then, well, we need that information to then decide, do you need stents, do you need bypass, uh, or other actual treatment plans. Um, but of course, doing coronary angiography, and this is I said, what came out with the Adelaide data, was that, they did a lot more coronary angiograms, and yes, they picked up more disease, but in the end, they caused an equivalent amount of heart attacks as they prevented with doing that. So when, so they, when they do an angiogram, they'll uh, like thread a wire up through the artery and then put dye into the heart to unlock the vessels. So I guess the thing is we don't want to do those to people who don't need them, and alternatively, we don't want to send home people who then actually did need it and is trying to figure out a way to decide. I think there's a couple of questions. Yeah, so one of the, the questions come up about, um, is there any information about how COVID will influence the model? Uh, which is a fantastic <laughs> question. <laughs> well, outside of the scope. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll so, make the cut-off 20. Yeah, and, I mean, this is a very real question in terms of all of these sorts of databases, is that if we use historical databases, how applicable are they in the future? Now, there are certain things that don't change very much, Biology generally doesn't change that quickly, but some of the treatment modalities do and so on, and they certainly can alter risk factors. Um, 
obviously with the historical data there is no COVID information in there um, and touch wood there's very little COVID data in WA and hopefully it's going to stay that way um, because we don't have any. Certainly one of the concerns that are being expressed internationally is that this is potentially a very big, that this may have potentially a very big impact. We know that patients with COVID, um, one of the complications, the virus actually goes in through the angiotensin receptor and binds to the endothelial cells, and that's one of its targets uh, near the cells that line blood vessels. And that's why there's been this association with certain cardiovascular and clotting problems in some patients who got COVID. Um, what we don't know is, is that going to cause long-term problems? Are people going to recover and go back to their baseline risks? Or are in five years time, we're going to be saying, okay, yeah, you've got chest pain. Well, are you a smoker? Have you got high blood pressure? Did you get COVID? Because we know that that puts you at higher risk of heart attacks for the rest of your life. We don't have that data now, we don't know. It's something that a lot of people are, are thinking about. It's something that a lot of people are worried that that may be the case, but we don't know if it will be or whether or not it's all just going to go, no, you do fully recover. Certainly in the short term, there are indications that yes, it probably does cause increased rates of certain cardiovascular events. In, a, so in addition to the lung problems and the, the general problems from it. Hmm. Um, the other questions that have come up, uh, can you divide patient report into questions and store it as true or false? Um, that's what's been done historically to generate the data sets for most of these other models in that somebody Usually, you know, manually goes through the, the notes and ticks boxes that yes, this was present, no, they said yes, they said no, this was present, this wasn't present. Um, and I guess that's one of the big questions mm. is, is natural language processing there? Is it sort of good enough that we don't have to do that? Um, how, how big are the notes? They're, they're probably about an A4 page um, yeah. of documents, not so like dense text. Yeah. So for the for the initial presentation, yeah, probably a couple of pages, <coughs> occasionally longer. But for most most patients, it'll be maybe two pages. Um, Is it typed or handwritten? Typed. Typed in Afghanistan. Yeah. They've got an electronic <laughs> electronic medical record, uh, so it's typed in there. Uh, most of the other hospitals are still using paper based. Mm -hmm. um, um, but how many years is that? That you understand They they had electronic medical records from opening. Which is five years. Probably. Yes, five okay. years. Yeah, yeah. Um, having said which, some of the early stuff was handwritten and then scanned in, particularly when the computer system failed, which did happen a few times initially. Um, the other comment is: Is there a decision tree for the clinical process that shows what information is gathered at what point in the process? There are, as we've mentioned, decision trees and there are pathways that we use. Um, the issues with those are that that happens once somebody is put onto a pathway, which means that a decision has been made uh, that you're not going home, you are going to come in for this pathway, particularly with the repeat blood tests and ECGs. Um, and so for those patients, there is a I wouldn't call it quite standardised, semi-standardised approach in terms of timing, although there is a lot of variation and variability um, as to how that's been done. And it has changed over the years, because as I said, there's been a, a lot of effort to try and squeeze that time down from eight hour gap to six hour gap to three hour gap to two hour gap, and maybe even one hour occasionally. How many years you prepare to do deal with this problem? What is the timeline? Oh, it's <laughs> ongoing. Yeah, um, it, it easily, I think easily two or three, and then 
for like these projects that we're sort of talking about, but then I'm sure that's kind of op optimistic and there'll be... Um, oh yeah, I mean, pe more people will yeah. have careers based on this problem. And as we saw, you know, they, they've been doing this certainly even use, using neural networks since the 80s. Um, and prior to that, they were using decision trees and other approaches. Um, so... Because uh, what I see is there is a, a lot of tech lead and even the first step, even keening the data, <laughs> data um, have that um, gigantic um, table to capture everything initially. And you uh, later on you find you're missing a couple of columns, you're going bad. I think just that data collection, cleansing. Even before that, just getting the ethics approvals has been another oh. challenge. Oh, uh, ethics is standard. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the big problems one of the big problems that I think that you'll have with NLP is new spelling mistakes. So typically NLP relies on encoding like the corpus of words, all the possible words that it's seen, and it might be able to account for the spelling mistakes and the abbreviations that it's seen in the past. But if you give it a new one and you can't correct it into something sensible, then it doesn't know what to do with this, right? And it just kind of throws it away, right? And so then you might be, you know, trying to defend why the machine told you to send a patient home, and it's just because someone happened to, you know, spectacularly spell a word that human could put back together. Um, and so, like, the cost of consequence might be really high in terms of, like, making mistakes, um, which is just, it's an interesting space to be in. Um, yeah. Yeah, I really worry about all the new COVID thing will be become an unknown token when you train the model. It has to be right. Yeah, but later on, and then you add it, you just never capture it, so you never pick it up unless you. Depends how frequent you retrain your co uh, uh, corpus and retrain the model. Or, or, or you have like a spell checker that forces the doctors to only enter in certain words it's already trained on. <laughs> Because uh, <laughs> yeah. predictive tests ne text never get spelling right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, there's, uh, in some ways, I'm a little encouraged by the fact that we know that there's already so many problems with history that in many, well, certainly the previous models, it's been shown that it's not that good a predictor. Um, but yeah, a lot of it may well be uh, that we have to manually go through. But even within the history, there is some things that we know that are probably easy, uh, more definitive, such as, do you have diabetes? Are you a smoker? Have you had a heart attack before? Um, but obviously, any information that we can automate, the gleaming and the scraping of the information from the note, is going to save a huge amount of time and effort. Because um, I said otherwise, what, what has been done in the past is usually people sit there and go through with a you know, checkbox sheet mm -hmm. and go through the notice and tick boxes. The other idea is sort of, um, if you're doing something prospectively, having like an app or something where the patient is answering simple yes or no questions or having categorical sort of predefined, sort of like those GP health apps where Ask you questions so that that would be something a bit cleaner at least to deal with. But, but then we'll just tell you you've got cancer, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But you can kind of hand it to them while they're waiting for the triage. Or... It seems like you've got a lot of domain like, problems, right? You might as well just start so simple and build from there rather than yeah. try to solve everything. Yeah, I, know, I guess the, the in a way reassuring thing is that you can get so far with just age, gender, and two different troponin values. So adding in some extra data, maybe you can improve on that. Or maybe it just confuses things like, and I, I guess that's part of the research is um, whether it, it does improve things or whether this approach actually isn't the way we are tackling it. And either of those is, I suppose, valuable. Mm. Because I think you will have a very serious challenge to get the grand true data because your data set is quite messy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, just and multi multi domain as well. So I think you better to um, have different phase for your project breaking it down in a logical sense and then solve one small problem at a time.
at the moment, I think you take on too big a battle. Yeah. 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 It's about solving the biggest pain point, right? It's about yeah. finding that, it's that spot where you're the weakest mm. and then, you know, working yeah. ahead of all that. Yeah. 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 And, and I mean, there's, there's two, two prongs. To this. One is to try and look at creating a model with it. The other is also to, if we're going to be going through and starting to collect the data, to do it in such a way to try and minimise in the future, saying, oh, wish we done that right from the start mm -hmm. because now it's such a pain to either go back and try and put it in or we can't capture it now. Um, so yeah, part of it is to try and get an idea of mm -hmm. what can we realistically get that in the future may also be useful as well. Yeah. Um, but you could use your uh, NLP to extract important keywords out of the text and then mm -hmm. set those up as like clinical notes that people punch in yes or no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But also you can invest, um, just do some statistical analysis for your existing data set for the temporal data so you can actually kind of know which column is sensitive or not, which one is not. So based on that and then build your own um, data collection information. So you can't predict everything, but at least you can capture at least 80% for what you already can have. So, what would you start with? Oh, definitely tabular. <laughs> Image, you need to have that labeling kind of thing. And yeah, definitely just go to the tabular data, look into it, um, do some um, basic feature engineering, and then um, look at the, the, the feature, how sensitive are the feature, and then cut down a lot of noise, and then just just easy from that is much easier, and then train on the your network have the categorical and have to be married. Yeah, I just I would definitely start with um, tabo. And it's some sort of auto encoder on the images, train auto encoder, so you can basically convert your images into features on to like the smaller set of features. Yeah. So you can add them to the table. Yeah. So the ECG maybe even convert into an uh, image, and I will train on CNN. I will want. I will find it fun. <laughs> I, I just go from the point of view of um, taking, you know, build separate networks for each one, mm -hmm. try and make them as robust as possible. With not as talking as to this mic. We could use that thing to a feature vector, which is, which is then um, like a uh, an output for. Or, oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's an input into your time series. So as your time series goes, moves forwards, you'll get suddenly like a feature vector arrive, which is your clinical notes. You get a feature vector come in, which is your lab test, and so on. And so, you know, you're getting these different feature vectors appearing at different points in the time series. And the reason for that is that you can, you can then do that integration over all the different elements and get that temporal aspect of them while still capturing the individual aspects of the individual tests. Mm. Yeah, we are not mm. speaking to the mic, they have silence. Mm. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe closing soon. We can I, have I another. Think what you would want to do is train your model with certain amounts of time data allowed in. You know, so within the first hour of presentation, within two hours, within three hours, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're not leaking information about how long they happen to stay there on these tests. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think you're going to need many models to make this work to avoid that leakage because the leakage problem will kill you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, folks, so, so I think we've, we've, we've reached the end of there this evening, so I'd, I'd like to thank our, our, our speakers for tonight, and uh, that's a really great input from, from both of you, so much, much appreciated. Thank you very much for the time and input. Mm -hmm. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and all the uh, expert opinion. Um, someone has commented, is there any way I can get in touch? Uh, yes, that's fine. I, I can probably use this to... We put the contact details through uh, the Discord channel. Um, yeah, we, can, or we can share them in Slack and put them into Discord. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Much appreciated.